I was asked by the music people what, I, what song I wanted for a closing hymn. Um, one was this one, and another one was more reflective. And I said, let's go with the reflective one <laughs> for the closing. But uh, it gives us a good opportunity to be reminded of who God is and reminded of the love of God for us. You know, most of us have heard or learned this simple little prayer when we were children. It's a prayer that expresses words that are being thankful to God for food. It's a child's prayer before meals, and it goes like this. God is great, and God is good, and we thank him for our food. By his hand we all are fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. You may have used that as a parent with your children, or if you have a little Bible story book with poems and thoughts, uh, you probably read it in there as well. As a child, you may have repeated that many, many times before meals. May not have understood the words, may not have understood what was really happening and taking place, just something to say before we could eat. It was our way of saying grace, asking God to bless our time around the table and for the provision of food that comes from the very hand of God. A very simple message. God is great and God is good. But do we understand what the goodness of God is? We understand the greatness of God because we're going through many, many of the attributes of God and we see him in his greatness, his authority, his power, his sovereignty. And we know that he's a great God beyond all gods, but do we understand what is good when it comes to God? Or maybe even more basic, do we understand what good is? What is it when we talk about good? The word good can mean many things to many different people. And the reason for this is that good can only be described by using synonyms or words which reveal the character of good or goodness. In an online dictionary, there are at least 28 different citations for good. And so you can't come up with just one simple definition. I want to share just a few of these with you to give you an idea of how the word good is used, remembering that the good that as it's being used describes the character of good or goodness. Here's a few of them. Having or showing an upright and virtuous character. A good person. A good person. Affording pleasure or comfort. A good stake or a good book. Having undergone no deterioration or damage. Good shape or the milk is still good. Worthy of honor or high esteem, a good ruler, pleasant to look at, good looking, beneficial to health or well-being, good for you. And you can see how all these things, there are many more that talk about good, which is a reflection upon the character of that which you're talking about. It's used in many, many different ways. It's used to describe the character of good or goodness that is positive and beneficial. And when you look at these characteristics of good, descriptions that we're giving here, they can and they do apply to the very nature and character of God from whom all goodness comes and from whom all good things come. As we've been looking at the nature and character of God, the attributes of God, uh, we've come up with some very powerful and some very awesome attributes. God is holy. God is eternal. God is just. God is sovereign. An infinitely great God, an infinitely pure God can be terrifying when you really stop to think of who he is and the authority and the power and, and the greatness of God. No man can come before God without being humble and we see all of the, the great and awesome characteristics and we do fall before him in humility. But do we understand the goodness of God? That good character of God is the one that brings all of the other characteristics of God into a proper understanding of who he is. God is good. And all of the attributes of God, as we've seen, operate in perfect unity. The Apostle Paul called the church in Rome to contemplate the balance between the severity and the kindness or the goodness of God in Romans chapter 11, verse 22. He said, note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. The severity of God and the kindness of God. The fact that God is sovereign and God is holy and God is just, characterized by the goodness 
and the very nature of God. God is good. And when we think of God's goodness, we think of his good will towards all men. Specific acts that show men that God is concerned about them. Good acts such as mercy and justice and love and truth and kindness and so on. God is good in his dealings with us. God is good all the time. Didn't we just go through this uh, at the beginning of... Uh, all right. I may have thrown you a curveball. Stick with me here on this as to what's going on. The goodness of God is uh, revealed to us every day. It's a thread of truth that runs throughout the scripture as well as throughout our life. But God's, God's limit. God's goodness is not limited to a particular group of people, such as those who are his followers, but God's goodness is universal. And the purpose of the goodness of God is to lead men and women, and boys and girls, to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why God is a good God. He is revealing to us who he is. He's revealing to us who his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is. The psalmist tells us, the Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. It's universal. It's not just to a select group. It's not just to a few people, but it is to everyone. God's goodness is seen everywhere and that his works and activities are evident all over the world. Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, God causes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Doesn't make any difference if you're a good person or a bad person. God's goodness is revealed to everyone. God is good in that he takes care of his creation. He takes care of the people of his creation as well. If the crops need rain, God sends rain. Sends it on the good man's property as well as on the evil man's property. God's goodness is universal and he treats all men the same. That is a blessing to know and a blessing to understand. Because God's goodness is not based upon who we are. God's goodness is not based upon what we would do. In other words, good for good. If we're good, then God will be good to us. Not at all. The reason God is good to us is because it's in his very nature, it's his character as to who he is. God is a good God. J.I. Packer, a British-born Canadian theologian in the Anglican and Reformed tradition, wrote this. He said, God is continually inclined to deal well and bountifully with his creatures. Generally, references to the goodness of God focus on his interaction with his creatures. It refers to his disposition to give to others in a way which has no selfish motive and is not limited by what the recipients deserve, but consistently goes beyond it. God's goodness goes beyond what we deserve, goes beyond what we might think is appropriate. God's goodness is there forever and forever in abundance. But you know, not everyone would agree that God is always good. You know, if God was so good, then how come he allows Fill in the blank. If God is a good God, how come there are wars and famine and death and suffering and poverty and evil of all kinds? How does that goodness of God deal with those types of things that we face within our daily life? Yet deep within our hearts, we believe in a good God. But how shallow is our understanding of his goodness, especially since we see many things that seem to deny it? If God is a good God, we know it to be true, we don't fully understand it, then it's not a problem with who God is, it's a problem with our understanding. It's a problem of our looking at God, our problem of helping us to understand who God is. I think Corey Ten Boom clarifies this issue for us or helps clarify this issue. I think you're familiar with her. Corey Ten Boom was a Dutch Christian. Her family helped Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. And by all accounts, she and her family saved over 18, or over 800 lives, 800 lives in a secret room called the hiding place. She and her family were found out. They were arrested by the Gestapo. They were imprisoned in Ravensbrück concentration camp. And she's the author of the book that you may have read, The Hiding Place. She was a frequent speaker concerning her experiences and faith in God. She died in 1983. This is her clarification of the goodness of God. She said, often I have heard people say how good God is. 
We pray that it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. Yes, God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there. Everything around us was dark and there was darkness in my heart. I remember telling Betsy that I thought God had forsaken us. No, Corey, said Betsy, he has not forgotten us. Remember his word, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And Corey concludes, there is an ocean of God's love available. There is plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love, whatever the circumstances. God is good all the time, and the scriptures are adamant in declaring that. That God is good, and therefore he does good. Even though we may not look at it, even though we may not be experiencing what we would call good, God is good all the time. Now we can't base our theology on anecdotal information or on the anecdotal evidence, that which we see and that which we observe. Our theology is not based upon observation. Our theology is based on the belief in God, on his character, his attributes, and his word. And so we need to look at the words of scripture. I have 12 of them. I'm just going to read them for you this morning. Listen, write them down if you want, and look at them a little closer later on. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, which we read this morning. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name, for the Lord is good, and his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness to all generations. Psalm 106, verse 1. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Psalm 86, verse 5. You, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. Psalm 119, verse 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Psalm 145, verse 7. They shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and shall shout joyfully of your righteousness. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of heavenly lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Matthew 7.11, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Psalm 143 verse 10, teach me to do your will for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Luke 18, verse 19. And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. If you go through scripture, and these are just 12 of them, many, 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 many passages of scripture that talk about the goodness of God, the goodness of God. These are just a few of the good acts of God shown towards his creation and his people. God forgives us of our sin. He teaches us of himself and his ways. He's our refuge. He leads us down that path of a righteous and a right life. God is good. You know, it's not a mistake that our modern English word good comes from the old English word God. Because God is a very definition of good. And just as he cannot do anything but holy and righteous things, God cannot be other than good because he is good. He is good, he always does good. And Jesus spent his whole ministry demonstrating that demonstrating the goodness of God. Jesus was anointed by God with the Holy Spirit, with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, and God was with him. The goodness of God is consistently on display all around us, both physically and spiritually. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, 
I read one verse from that just a moment ago. It's a story of the rich young ruler. This young man came to Jesus with a question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus' answer was <clears throat> to get rid of all the things that are keeping you from following me. He said, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. What this young man wanted was to enter heaven by following the Ten Commandments and living a life of comfort and ease with the reward of a good life lived here upon this earth, being eternal life in heaven. But when this rich young man came to Jesus, he addressed him as good teacher. Good teacher. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Our Jehovah Witness friends use this passage to show that Jesus is denying his divinity and pointing the rich young man to God the Father alone. But Jesus is doing no such thing. In fact, Jesus is saying, you recognize me as good. God alone is good, therefore I am God. Follow me and you will have eternal life. And God through Jesus Christ is the only way to eternal life. Jesus said to Philip, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And Jesus told Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Peter, preaching to the Sanhedrin, the religious leaders of Judaism, stated that salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There is only one way, one way to God, only one way to eternal life, only one way to forgiveness, and that is through the good teacher, that is through Jesus Christ. God's goodness is expressed to us through Jesus from our daily activities to salvation and ultimately to our eternal life with him. There's a popular little chorus from a few years ago. It's entitled, God is so good. It's in the back of our hymn book. You got a hymn book there in front of you, take it out. Turn to page 607. 607, we generally sing it, and when we did sing it, we'd probably sing the first verse and several times, and then we would move on to uh, the other verses as well. But there are, are several verses within this little course. <clears throat> verse number one says, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good, he's so good to me. Verse two, Jesus is real, he is so real to me. Verse three, he saved my soul and he made me whole. Verse four, I praise his name, he's so good to me. I love him so, he's so good to me. Verse number six, coming again, he's so good to me. And what you have is from the cradle to the grave that God is so good. He's so good to his creation, to mankind in general. God is so good and to his children in particular, God is so good. You look at this little chorus as we sing it. You look at the fact of God's goodness, which is indisputable and undeniable, yet the actions of his goodness oftentimes see inadequate or unfair. You know, as we look around and see the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, we often ask, God, if you are a good God, why doesn't it appear that your goodness doesn't translate to our goodness? If you're such a good God, why does it appear that it's not for our good. The author of Psalm 73 wrote a song about his struggle with the prosperity of the wicked. And this is what he said in looking at himself as a follower of Jehovah God and looking at the wicked, he said this, Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, I envy the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles, their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from the burdens common to man. This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Now, I don't know about you, but I felt like that psalmist at times. It's easy to look around us and complain about the circumstances of our life. It's easy to blame God or doubt his love and to doubt his goodness in the face of societal and world events. 
But yet the Bible is very clear that God works all things together for his good, for his glory, and for our ultimate good. In Psalm 107, it begins with these words. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. And then follows a brief account of how God's goodness was revealed in the midst of the individual as well as national difficulties. And it ends with this thought. It says, whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. God is good. I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to turn to Psalm 107. Pew Bible 432. And rather than picking out selected verses, I want to read this psalm in its entirety. And I want you to notice as I read and as you follow along the goodness of God. Psalm 107, as Joe said this morning, Psalm 100 is a short psalm. Psalm 107 is a lengthy psalm. We're going to read it in its entirety. Sometimes we fail to do that in a a public worship service. We do take selected verses to highlight what we're talking about, but I think reading all of Psalm 107 will help us to see once again the goodness of God even in the midst of difficulties. Psalm 107, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say this, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from the east and the west, from the north and the south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, For they had rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools though their rebel- through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. Others went out in the sea in ships. They were merchants on the mighty waters. They saw the works of the Lord, his wonderful deeds in the deep. For he spoke and stirred up the tempest that lifted high the waves. They mounted up to the heavens and went down to the depths. In their peril, their courage melted away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at their wit's end. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the council of the elders. He turned rivers into deserts, flowing springs into thirsty ground, and fruitful land into salt waste because of the wickedness of those who lived there. He turned the desert into pools of water and the parched ground into flowing springs. There he brought the hungry to live, and they founded a city where they could settle. They sowed fields and planted vineyards. They yielded a fruitful harvest. He blessed them and their numbers greatly increased, and he did not let their herds diminish. Then their numbers decreased, and they were humbled by oppression, calamity, and sorrow. He who pours contempt on nobles make them wander in a trackless waste, but he lifted the needy out of their affliction and increased their families like flocks. 
The upright see and rejoice, but all the wicked shut their mouths. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of the Lord. Consider the great love of the Lord. Consider the great goodness of the Lord. I wonder this morning, do you know the goodness of God in your life? Even in difficulty, even when things may not be going as you would desire them to be, do you know the goodness of God? God's goodness is revealed in his son Jesus and his kind acts towards you. A.W. Tozer wrote that Jesus revealed the very nature and character of God while he walked upon this earth, and this is what he wrote. He said, Jesus walked with men on earth that he might show them what God is like and make known the true nature of God to a race that had wrong ideas about him. This was only one of the things he did well here in the flesh, but this he did with beautiful perfection. He continues, from him we learn how God acts towards people. The hypocritical, the basically insincere will find him cold and aloof as they once found Jesus. But the penitent will find him merciful. The self-condemned will find him generous and kind. To the frightened, he is friendly. To the poor in spirit, he is forgiving. To the ignorant, considerate. To the weak, gentle. And to the stranger, hospitable. You know, to know the goodness of God is to rejoice in his goodness and to be able to share that goodness with others. That same goodness that was first revealed in our Heavenly Father and in our Savior Jesus Christ should be demonstrated in our lives by God the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit, goodness. It's what we have received. It's what we must share with others. And may your good God be glorified by your good works, and may your life be victorious and pleasing to God as you obey his command which was given to us through the Apostle Paul who wrote these words, do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. The psalmist tells a sinner and the saint alike, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Have you tasted the Lord this morning? Have you tasted the goodness of the Lord? Are you growing in your relationship with Jesus? The Apostle Peter said, grow in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Not sure how to land this plane this morning, (laughs) but let me just share two thoughts with you in, in closing. Number one, reaffirm the truth of God's goodness in your life. Reaffirm the truth of God's goodness in your life. Know it to be true. Know that God loves you and that his actions towards you are good. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever, his faithfulness through all generations. Reaffirm the truth of God's goodness in your life. Number two, reflect on God's goodness in your life. Reflect on how God has blessed, how God is good within your life. As we've been reminded, just as God is good and does good, we as his children are called to do good as well. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. Reaffirm and reflect. Reaffirm the truth of God's goodness. Reflect upon what that means for you and be able to share it with others. God is good. There is none like him. None like him. Incomparable. Worship and serve your good God and live a life of goodness. May God's goodness be seen in each of us today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we we thank you for your goodness for your loving kindness, for your unfailing love towards us in in every way, in our salvation, in our care, in, in pardoning us, in preserving us, protecting us, providing for us. And Father, you permit us to go through certain things, but as we go through these things, I pray that you would preserve us through them to the very end. Because Lord, we declare today, we reaffirm 
that you are a good God. We reflect upon that goodness and how it might affect us in sharing Jesus. And so, Lord, help us to trust you all the more. Help us to lift up the name of Jesus. Help us to declare you as a God that is so good, so good to us, and yet so good to all. We thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.